The Edwardians dined on a banquet of rich gourmet foods, from fowl and game to puddings and jellies. But that was the diet of the gentry, of course. Everyday folk couldn't afford such delicacies. A working man's treat amounted to a few rashers of bacon and a bit of fish, and only then if the money he took home allowed it, after the rent. The staple diet for most people was bread, meat and potatoes. But bread was first and foremost. It was cheapest and, for those short of the rent money or reduced into poverty through lack of work, bread was likely to be your only meal. In 1909, Maud Pember Reeves, a social reformer, initiated a study through the Fabian Women's Group into the domestic lives of new mothers and how they managed to live on around a pound, or 20 shillings, a week. The group's aim was to provide financial help in the expectation that infant health and survival rates would improve. Not only was this achieved, but the women demonstrated that high death rates among children was not the fault of maternal ignorance or negligence, but poverty. In Edwardian society, and before the First World War, men were the source of wealth, women had few opportunities for work, and, if it could be found, wages were lower. A working man's wife in receipt of a regular allowance from her husband divided it as follows. Rent burial insurance, coal and light, cleaning materials, clothing and food. Many were living on a budget of 20 shillings or less a week, and, besides keeping themselves, parents often had between six and eight children to clothe and feed. In this video, you will learn from Maud Pember Reeves what typical working-class families ate in Edwardian London, within the district of Lambeth, I would be interested to read your opinions in the comment section about the diet of these families and, if you found yourself in similar circumstances, whether you would or could eat the same foods given a tight budget and what was available to you. You should note that these were families of manual labourers who lived in typically working-class streets in Lambeth and not its poorest inhabitants who inhabited the slums. The Fabian Women's Group wanted to show that the standard of living of the working classes was below a level that could support good health or nutrition. You can imagine that families living in yet greater hardship through unemployment struggled to feed their children anything close to even this diet, let alone themselves. Before we move on, Please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. You can also support the channel and get access to exclusive perks by becoming a channel member. Check out the Join button and description for more. Two questions. Besides that of the amount of money to be spent bear upon food, what are the chief articles of diet? Where are they bought? Without doubt, the chief article of diet in a twenty-shilling budget is bread. A long way after bread come potatoes, meat and fish. Bread is bought from one of the abundance of bakers in the neighbourhood, and is not as a rule very different in price and quality from bread in other parts of London. Bread in Lambeth is bought in the shop because the baker is bound, when selling over the counter, to give legal weight. In other words, when he is paid for a quartern, he must sell a quartern, a traditional English unit of weight of about four pounds for a loaf of bread. He therefore weighs two half-quartern loaves, and makes up with pieces of bread cut from loaves he keeps by him for the purpose until the weight is correct. In different districts, Bakers sell a quartern for slightly different prices. The price at one moment south of Kennington Park may be five pence, while up in Lambeth proper it may be five and a half pence. In Kensington, at the same moment, delivered bread is perhaps being sold at six pence a quartern. The difference in price, therefore, at a given moment, might amount to as much as seven pence a week in the case of a large family, and three pence in the case of a small family. When a weekly income is decreased for any cause, 
The one item of food which seldom varies, or at any rate is the last to vary, is bread. Meat may sink from four shillings a week to six pence, owing to a fluctuation in income, but the amount of bread bought when the full allowance was paid is, if possible, still bought when meat may have almost decreased to nothing. Mrs. S., a widow, had an extraordinary knack of getting things cheap. All her bread was fetched by her eldest boy of thirteen from the back door of a big restaurant once a week. It lived in a large bag hung on a nail behind the door, and got very stale towards the end of the week. But it was good bread. She could get about one hundred broken rolls for one shilling nine pence. Bread is the chief food of the working classes. It is cheap. They like it. It comes into the house ready cooked. It is always at hand, and needs no plate and spoon. Spread with a scraping of butter, jam, or margarine, according to the length of purse of the mother. They never tire of it as long as they are in their ordinary state of health. They receive it into their hands, and can please themselves as to where and how they eat it. It makes the sole article in the menu for two meals in the day. The usual plan for a Lambeth housekeeper is to make her great purchase on Saturday evening, when she gets her allowance. She probably buys the soap, wood, oil, tea, sugar, margarine, tinned milk, and perhaps jam for the week. To these she adds the Sunday dinner, which means a joint, or part of a joint, greens and potatoes. The bread she gets daily, also the rasher, fish, or other relish, for her husband's special use. Further purchases of meat are made, if they are made, about Wednesday, while potatoes and pot-herbs, as well as fish, often come round on barrows, and are usually bought as required. The visitors were sometimes left, to the mercy of bursts of memory on the part of mother with regard accounts of groceries, for some could neither read nor write. Records were garnered from recollections of shopping such as these. Hey, uh, give me twenty-two bob a Saturday. After I put Ernie to bed, I went shopping in the walk. Long pause. I know I got half a shelter a month and that one shilling nine pence and three pounds of potatoes, and they was one and a half pence, and a cabbage which uh, he said was as fresh as a daisy, but it turned out to be all fainty-like when I come to cook it. Meat is generally bargained for on street stalls on Saturday night or even Sunday morning. It may be cheaper than meat purchased in the West End, but is as certainly worse in original quality, as well as less fresh and less clean in condition. It is difficult to arrive at the quantity of meat, as it is often bargained for and sold by the piece without weighing. The experienced housewife offers so much, while the ticket on the meat is offering it for so much more. A compromise is arrived at, and the commodity changes hands. Pieces are sold by weight, but are of various qualities and prices. Good Pieces may be sixpence per pound. Fair pieces are sold for four and a half pence, which is the most common price paid for them. But inferior pieces can be had for three pence on occasions. They are usually gristle and sinew at that price. Meat is bought for the men, and the chief expenditure is made in preparation for Sunday's dinner, when the man is at home. It is eaten cold by him the next day. The children get a pound of pieces stewed for them during the week, and with plenty of potatoes they make a great show with the gravy. Dinner may consist of anything, from the joint on Sunday to boiled rice on Friday. The Sunday dinner requires thought, but tends to repeat itself with the more methodical housewife, who has perhaps a leaning towards neck of mutton as the most interesting of the cheaper joints or towards a half-shoulder, as cutting to better advantage. It is often the same dinner week after week, one course of meat with greens and potatoes. Some women indulge in flights of fancy, and treat the family to a few pounds of fat bacon at sixpence per pound, 
a quality which is not to be recommended, or even to the extravagance of a rabbit and onions for a change. These women would be likely to vary the vegetables too, and in their accounts tomatoes, when tomatoes are cheap, may appear. It is only in the budgets of the very small family, however, that such extravagant luxuries would creep in. Potatoes will play a great part, as a rule, at dinner, but breakfast and tea will be bread. Potatoes are generally two pounds for one pence, unless they are new potatoes, then they are dearer, when at certain seasons in the year they are old potatoes, they are cheaper, but then they do not cut up well, owing to the sprouting eyes. They are usually bought from an itinerant barrow, as is fish. Potatoes are not an expensive item in the twenty-shilling budget. They may cost one shilling three pence a week in a family of ten persons, and four pence a week in a family of three, but they are an invariable item. Greens may go, butter may go, meat may diminish almost to the vanishing point before potatoes are affected. When potatoes do not appear for dinner, their place will be taken by suet pudding, which will mean that there is no gravy or dripping to eat with them. Treacle, or as the shop round the corner calls it, golden syrup, will probably be eaten with the pudding and the two together will form a midday meal for the mother and children in a working man's family. All these are good, bread, potatoes, and suet pudding, but children need other food as well. First and foremost, children need milk. All children need milk, not only infants in arms. When a woman weans her child, she ought to be able to give it plenty of milk or food made with milk. I well remember a course of eloquent and striking lectures delivered by an able medical man to an audience of West End charitable ladies. He ended his course by telling his audience that, if they wished to do good to the children of the poor, they would do more towards effecting their purpose if they were to walk through East End streets with placards bearing the legend, Milk is the proper food for infants. <laughs> than by taking any other action he could think of. His audience was deeply interested and utterly believing. The fact that the children of the poor never taste milk once they cease to be nursed by their mothers was well known to the lecturer through his hospital experience, and hence his earnest appeal to have the mothers of those children taught what was proper food to give them. He was, however, wrong in his idea that poor women do not realize that milk is the proper food for infants. The reason why the infants do not get milk is the reason why they do not get good housing or comfortable clothing. It is too expensive. Milk costs the same, four pence a quart, in Lambeth that it costs in Mayfair. A healthy child ought to be able to use a quart of milk a day, which means a weekly milk bill for that child of two shillings four pence, quite an impossible amount, when the food of the whole family may have to be supplied out of eight shillings or nine shillings a week. Even a pint a day means one shilling two pence a week, so that it is out of the question. Though a pint a day would not suffice for a child of a year old, who would need his or her full share of potatoes and gravy and bread as well. As it is, the only milk the children of the labourer get is the separated tinned milk, sold in one pence, two pence, three pence, and four pence tins, according to size. These tins bear upon them in large red letters the legend, This milk is not recommended as food for infants. The children do not get too much even of such milk. Families of ten persons would take two tins at three and a half pence in the week. Families of five, six, or seven would probably get one such tin. It is used to put in tea which, as it is extremely sweet, it furnishes with sugar as well as with milk. Sometimes it is spread on the breakfast slice of bread instead of butter or jam. 
An inexperienced visitor probably suggests that it would make a good milk pudding, but is silenced by hearing that it would take half a tin to make one pudding, and then there is no richness in it. Some people have suggested skim milk as a way round this very terrible deprivation of the hard-working poor, but skim milk does not take the place of whole milk as a food for infants. Parents who are comfortably off would never dream of starving their infants upon it. Even supposing that the children of the poor could magically flourish upon skim milk alone, there is not enough of it on the market to allow its use to be regarded as a universal panacea for hungry babies. In fact, it is worth a moment's speculation as to whether the whole milk supply of England is sufficient to ensure a quarter day to each English child under five years of age. It is more than likely that, unless the milk supply were enormously increased, adults would have to go entirely without milk, should the nation suddenly awake to its duty towards its children. As things are, once weaned, the child of a labouring man gets its share of the family diet. It gets its share of the four-pence tin of separated milk, its share of gravy and potatoes, a sip of cocoa on which three pence or four pence a week may be spent for the use of everyone, and, if its father be particularly partial to it, a mouthful of fat bacon once or twice a week, spared from the not-too-generous relish to his tea. Besides these extras, it gets bread." The equipment for cooking is as unsatisfactory. One kettle, one frying pan, and two saucepans, both burnt, are often the complete outfit. The woman with twenty-two shillings a week upon which to rear a family may not be a professed cook and may not understand food values. She would probably be a still more discouraged woman than she is if she were and if she did but she knows the weak points of her old saucepans, and the number of pennies she can afford to spend on coal and gas, and the amount of time she can allow herself in which to do her cooking. She is forced to give more weight to the consideration of possible time and possible money than the considerations of excellence of cooking or extra food value. Also, she must cook for her husband food which he likes, rather than food which she may consider of greater scientific value, which he may dislike. The visitors in this investigation hope to carry with them a gospel of porridge to the hard-worked mothers of families in Lambeth. The women of Lambeth listened patiently, according to their way agreed to all that was said, and did not begin to feed their families on porridge, being there to watch and note rather than to teach and preach. The visitors waited to hear, when and how they could, what the objection was. It was not one reason, but many. Porridge needs long cooking. If on the gas, that means expense. If on an open fire, constant stirring and watching just when the mother is busy getting the children up. Moreover, the fire is often not lit before breakfast. It was pointed out that porridge is a food which will keep when made. It could be cooked when the children are at school, and merely warmed up in the morning. The women agreed again, but still no porridge. It seemed, after further patient waiting on the part of the visitors, that the husbands and children could not abide porridge. To use the expressive language of the district, they eaved at it. Why? Well cooked the day before, and eaten with milk and sugar, all children liked porridge. But the mothers held up their hands. Milk! Who could give milk or sugar either, for that matter? Of course, if you could give them milk and sugar, no wonder! They might eat it then, even if it was a bit burnt. Porridge was an awful thing to burn in old pots if you left it a minute, and if you set the pot flat on its bottom instead of holding it all to one side to keep the burnt place away from the flame, it would catch at once. And then, if you happened to cook fish or stew in the pot for dinner, there was a kind of taste come out in the porridge. 
It was more than they could even bear to see children who was hungry, mind you, pushing their food away or eating at it. So it usually ended in a slice of bread and marge all round and a drink of tea, which was the breakfast they were accustomed to. One woman wound up a long and patient explanation of why she did not give her husband porridge with, And besides, my young man, he say, If you give me that stinking mess, I'll throw it at you. Those were the reasons. It is true that to make porridge a good pot, which is not burnt, and which is not used for fish or stew, is needed. It is also true to eat porridge with the best results milk is needed. If neither of these necessities can be obtained, porridge is apt to be burnt or half-cooked, and is in either case very unpalatable. Children do not thrive on food they loathe, and men who are starting for a hard day's work refuse even to consider the question. What is the mother to do? Of course, she gives them the food they like and can eat bread and margarine, bread and jam with a drop of hot weak tea. The women are very fond of Quaker oats when they can afford the luxury, and if milk is provided to drink with it. They can cook a little portion in a tin enameled cup and so escape the family saucepan. The articles of diet other than bread, meat and potatoes, with occasional suet puddings and tinned milk, are fish, of which a shilling's worth may be bought a week, and of which quite half will go to provide the breadwinner with relishes, while the other half may be eaten by the mother and children. Bacon, which will be entirely consumed by the man, and an occasional egg. Some houses maintain the tightest economy. Mrs. P. discovered the plan of buying seven cracked eggs for three pence, as she said, it might lose you a little of the egg, but you can smell it first, which is a convenience. The tiny amounts of tea, dripping, butter, jam, sugar, and greens may be regarded rather in the light of condiments than of food. The diet where there are several children is obviously chosen for its cheapness, and is of the filling, stodgy kind. There is not enough of anything but bread. There is no variety. Nothing is considered but money.